Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and this is Mop. Okay, uh, he, Mop is not used to the um, camera so much as uh, Shackleton is, or even Sally. But uh, anyway, she's coming around. She knows that she, she doesn't want to miss out on the excitement of being a, a, a video star. So, But I think she's just about had enough here. Come on, it's okay. No, you're going to hiss at me? Uh oh, uh oh. Okay, 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 okay. Down you get. Down you get. See, she's got to get used to it a bit. <laughs> anyway, um, in this video and probably the next few, I'm going to talk about proxy evidence for state dependence of climate sensitivity in the Eocene greenhouse. Okay, now it sounds a bit complicated, so I'll divide it up. First of all, I'll talk about what we mean by proxies and what some of the proxies are. Okay, they're methods in paleoclimate. It's some physical, um, it's some physical characteristic of of, of uh, a material or substance that allows us to tease out information on temperature and CO two levels and um, rates of change and things. Um, in in the paleoclimate, so climate of you know long time ago in the past when we didn't have you know modern instrumentation, um, I'll talk about the climate sensitivity, and there's basically three main types we can talk about. We can talk about equilibrium climate sensitivity or ECS, which is the sort of long term uh, change sensitivity. It's it's a change in temperature to the change in CO two. So it's when, when we get a doubling, um, it's defined as when we get a, a doubling of um, CO2, you know, what is, what is the temperature reach in the equilibrium? That's when you incorporate the deep ocean heating and, and stuff and other feedbacks. And then you can have the transient climate response, and that would be the climate response. You know, if we're increasing CO2, you know, 1% a year, and we get a doubling of CO2, you know, what will be the temperature at the point when that doubling is reached? That's the transient climate response, or TCR. And then there's also a, uh, the EE equilibrium, um, equilibrium system um, response, uh, which is, uh, you know, when you look even longer term and you look at the effects of, uh, you know, glacier changes, etc., on the temperature reach so that's even longer term than the than the equilibrium climate sensitivity so okay so i'll be talking about those things and then i'll have to talk a little bit about the eoc and i'll talk about a great skeptical science uh, which is a, a website from scientists um, you know had an article on the eoc and specifically on the paleocene eocene thermal maximum about 56 million years ago Okay, so I'll talk about that, and then I'll come back to this paper. This paper is basically showing that the equilibrium climate sensitivity is larger uh, when you when you're when you when you're in a warmer planet. So if the temperature is warmer, the change of temperature uh, per per uh, for a doubling of of uh, CO two becomes actually much much larger than it is if you start in a colder climate so and that's very important for today because you know we we, we basically the accepted value is about b between 1.5 degrees celsius to 4.5 degrees celsius um is is the accepted sort of ballpark for equilibrium climate sensitivity so that's for a doubling of, of co2 um so you know the mid-range of that is three degrees celsius so it's likely to be higher then um, the, the sensitivity seems to change depending on the initial state that we're in, if we're in a colder climate, warmer climate, et cetera. So I'll talk about all of those uh, details, and I'll try to do this in, an, in a manner which is easily understood by most people. So I'll focus on the, you know, the key important factors. So this is an um, open source paper, Proxy Evidence for State Dependence of Climate Sensitivity in the Eocene greenhouse, which is the focus of, of this uh, series of videos. So um, 
so you know this uh so i'll give a little plug for my website paulbeckwith.net i just last um post was i was talking about salty oceans so the oceans of course saltier the average um salinity is about uh 35 psu practical salinity units something like that and uh because of the amplification of the hydrological cycle wet air is getting wetter dry air is getting drier more extreme weather event um, the parts of the ocean that tend to be saltier are actually getting even saltier and the parts of the ocean that are a bit fresher are getting fresher like notably the arctic but there are other regions um, so have a this is all about saltiness so have a look please consider donating to my uh, paypal um, this is my youtube channel remember that you can find i've done videos on all different topics over the years so just go and do a search for a specific uh, topic that you're interested in and i'm sure i have videos that that cover it and um you know if you're not following me at paul h beckwith on twitter uh please do so this is the twitter um this is my uh the last post where i talk about the uh, saltiness of the ocean and um i don't stray from controversy so you know i just made a point here i'm not starting any any conspiracy theories or anything but i just made the point that the timing of of ginsburg's death seems to be almost too perfect for trump since the new scotus may give a second term for potus 45 for trump even if biden wins the election i mean the supreme court rules you know we had this thing happening in 2000 with bush gore um, so is it possible that potus nefariously speeded up the demise of rpg um, you know, I don't know. I mean, the importance of this Supreme Court thing is enormous, not just for the election coming up, but also for, you know, rulings on Obamacare, rulings on abortion, Roe versus Wade, etc. You know, it's enormous. And when there's that importance, um, you know, you want to you want to rule out the possibility of anything nefarious going on. So I don't know if there was an autopsy. I mean, she was very sick, had the cancer, but the timing, you know, is just is just uh, suspect. It's awful. So I don't know. I'm just ask, I just ask these questions. I just throw out these things. Um, and uh, you know, here's a good puzzle. Uh, you know, stop the video if you and try to solve this. You just have to. You've got six plus four equals four. You move one stick. Of course, this doesn't. Six plus four is ten, right? So this equation isn't valid. So you got to move one stick and make the equation valid. And there's at least three ways of doing it that I know about. So have a think about that um, and ha have a look at that. Okay. So now getting back to this paper, um, I want to talk first of all about proxy evidence. So this is a good uh, briefer on what are proxy data. So historical records, corals, um, pollen, okay, uh, ice cores in the uh, glaciers, tree rings, um, stalactites and stalagmites, speleothems in caves, okay, uh, marine sediments is another one. There's no image for that. I mean, there's lots of them. So paleoclimatology is the study of past climates. Scientists use proxy data to reconstruct past climate conditions. Okay, so there's a, these are natural recorders of climate variability. So it's corals, the growth of corals, pollen in sediments, ice cores, tree rings, caves, pack rat middens, ocean and lake sediments, and historical data. So historical data, right? That's a, a type of proxy data. For example, ship and farmer's logs, travelers, diaries, newspaper accounts, other written records. So if they're evaluated properly, you can get good information. So an example, scientists used historical grape harvest dates to reconstruct summer temperatures between April and September in Paris from 1370 to 1879. Okay, so that's an example. You can use this, these historical grape harvest dates, which were accurately recorded every year, um, to reconstruct the summer temperatures between April and September in, 
you know, in, in Paris for over this, from 1370 to 1879, over a long period of time, long time ago. Corals, they build their hard skeletons from calcium carbonate, which is a mineral extracted from seawater. The density of these calcium carbonate skeletons changes as water temperature, light, and nutrient conditions change. Okay, so that gives, uh, so coral skeletons in the summer are a different density than that in the winter, right? They'll grow faster generally. So you can find out as the seasonal growth, um, and you can also look at isotopes of oxygen that are in the calcium carbonate to determine the temperature of the water in which the coral grew. So you can reconstruct the climate where, when the coral lived. Okay, uh, this is one that we won't have uh, soon if all the coral, if we lose all our coral, all the coral dissolves because of the acidification of the oceans and the water temperatures being too, too hot for them. Pollen, okay, so all flowering plants produce pollen grains. These grains um, identify the type of plant from which they came and they're well preserved in the sediment layers in the bottom of ponds, lakes, or the ocean. So you analyze the pollen grains in each layer and it tells you what type of plants were growing at the time the sediment was deposited and that the type of plant distribution of the different types of plants can then give you, let you make inferences about the temperature, for example, in those regions where the plants were grown. Ice cores, okay, not just high in the mountains and near the poles, the ice is, accumulates, so snowfall lands on, you know, and accumulates and accumulates, turns into ice, so you drill into the ice, you look at the different layers, the layers contain dust, air bubbles, isotopes of oxygen, and it differs, they differ from year to year based on the surrounding environment, so you can interpret the past climate in that area. You can get information on temperature, precipitation, atmospheric composition, like how much CO2, how much methane, et cetera, volcanic activity from the ash, and even wind patterns. You know, if you know where the volcanoes occur, you can, and based on the distribution of the ash in the different cores in different places, you can, you can uh, infer information about the wind patterns, so the atmospheric circulation. Tree rings, okay, trees and their unique rings are, are also serve as proxy data. Climate conditions influence tree growth, the patterns in the tree ring widths, the density of the wood in the rings, the isotopic composition. These things all reflect variations in climate. In temperate regions where there's a distinct growing season, summer and winter, trees generally produce one ring a year, recording the climate conditions each year. If they depend heavily on warm temperatures or lots of moisture, the rings will be wider, you know, in wetter years, narrower in drought years. And the trees can grow to be hundreds to thousands of years old, and you could overlap, you know, get the, get the dead trees and find out when they were alive and match them. So look, get a record of the, of the tree rings throughout time, a record much longer than the lifetime of one individual tree. Caves and their unique rock formations serve as proxy data. So these are called, these underground chambers contain the secrets of Earth's climate and speleothems, known as stalactites, stalagmites, and other formations. So these things grow over time as water drips down from a cave ceiling. They contain minerals and mineral buildup in thin, shiny layers, and because the amount of water making its way into caves determines the amount they grow, these layers can indicate times of heavy precipitation and times of drought. Pack rat middens, okay, so plant-rich deposits called pack rat middens, the rats collect them, they build their nests, and then urine and other materials, they crystallize and preserve these middens for tens of thousands of years so that you can collect them, sort them, get dates on them and find out what type of plants were around way back when. Ocean and lake sediments, um, okay, sediments accumulate on the floors of Earth's oceans and lakes. Billions of tons of sediment accumulate in the ocean lake basins every year. You get a vast information, amount of information about the environment. So you drill cores in the sediments and you get tiny fossils and different chemicals and you can interpret uh, past climate. So these things are all proxy records, okay, and uh, so, you know, uh, I'll, so I'll talk, I've talked about proxies, next I'll talk about climate sensitivity, and I'll also talk about the Eocene, and then we'll get back to this paper. Thank you for listening.